Hey, I've been following his work with regard to Mono and GNOME and some of the things he's been doing on the Linux desktop. And um, I'm glad that he's going to be able to come and talk to us about some of the things that are happening on the Linux desktop, top, Linux desktop side and, um, and what's going on there. So I'm going to turn it over to him and uh, help me welcome him, please. All right. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I wrote an abstract and I mailed it to, uh, I mailed it in and I said I was going to, can you guys hear me okay? I feel like the voice of God is resounding from up in there. And it's one, Darth Vader, yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, but um, I decided, I don't, you know, I didn't decide, but it just sort of happened that the way my slides came together, the Linux desktop basically is only barely touched upon. So um, instead, I don't know, I'm going to sort of tell you guys a couple of stories, and I, hopefully they're interesting. And if not, you know, too bad for you. Um, I, I'm not getting paid to do this anyway, so. Um, but yeah, I, I just a little bit about me. I, I work at Novell. I've worked at Novell for about three and a half years. I joined Novell in 2003 um, when uh, the company that I started, Zimian, was sold to Novell. And at Novell, I've been pretty focused on the Linux desktop uh, for most of my time there. Does anybody here run a Linux desktop? I know some of you suckers don't because I've seen a lot of apples here at a free software event. I'm not really sure what that's about exactly. Mostly, mostly like the people who consider themselves the coolest people are the ones running the apples. It's running Linux. OK, Blizzards is running Linux. That's good. Um, it's a proprietary operating system. I don't know if you guys knew that. but. Mac OS X is basically a proprietary operating system. So, um, but somehow they've gotten people to think that you know they're cool by anyway. That's called marketing, I think. But um, so I've mostly worked on the Linux desktop. And actually, in a couple of weeks ago, I, I uh, took on a bigger job at Novell. I'm now the CTO for Linux at the company, and uh, trying to help figure out what we're doing in Linux altogether and 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 move our strategy forward. And, and as part of that, I'm, I'm moving to Germany. Um, next week. So, uh, so I should be packing right now. I've done no packing so far. So I'm going to give away most of my stuff, I think, as a result. So if anybody wants, uh, I've got two beds. They're in Boston. But if you want any <laughs> beds or anything, just let me know. All right. So I'm going to start off by telling you a story. Some of you, I think, have heard the story before, but, but I think it's a good one. And it starts in London in 1857. Um, I went online to Wikipedia to try to find out what events happened in 1857 to see if I could give you guys a flavor for what London was like back then. And the only thing I could find out was that the National Portrait Gallery opened in London in 1857. But I assume other things happened also, but they're just not mentioned in Wikipedia. So uh, under the 1857 entry. And the story involves three men. Uh, it begins with three men. This is one of them. His name is Richard Trench. He's, uh, he's an Irishman, he's from Dublin, uh, and he was a member of the English clergy, and he was a poet. This guy, not looking so good, not looking that healthy, uh, Herbert Coleridge, I think no relation to the poet, um, was, was the second man in our story. And James Furnival, this interesting looking character with the beard, and I've seen a couple of beards here, uh, not, none rival this one though. Uh, so James Furnival is sort of the third character. So Trench, Coleridge, and Furnival are sort of our actors in this story. And Trench uh, was primarily an Anglican archbishop. Coleridge was a barrister, practiced at the bar. And Furnival was an unusual character with a sort of hard to track down history of, uh, you know, his CV kind of meanders all over the place. For a while, he's a lawyer. Um, he inherits a huge amount of money from his father. His father was a surgeon but made his money by running a lunatic asylum in England. So he inherits lunatic asylum money, which I'd never heard of before. And uh, then he, uh, he founds a lot of things. He founds different organizations. He founds the College of Working Men in England. I'm not sure what that is. He, he eventually blows through all of his inheritance. But there was one thing that tied these three men together, which was that they were all part of something called the London Philological Society. So back in that day, there were a lot of societies. And I think these things kind of had two purposes. Number one, they gave the men in these organizations a, a way to come together around a common interest, an intellectual or academic pursuit, and discuss things together. 
And two, I think it gave them a way to get away from their wives. You know, they could all go to one building and, and pretend that, you know, whatever they were doing. So, I don't know, who knows what the London Philological Society was? Anybody? Okay, so there's only one guy who knows, and I'm happy that you're here. But that means that all the rest of you don't know. And in a second, I'm going to tell you, and then at least you'll have learned one thing during this talk. But the London Philological Society was basically an organization of word nerds, people who were really into words. They loved words. You know, they liked etymologies, the origins of words, where they came from. These were people who were really passionate about language and words. And this is a quote from Trench. Remember him? He says, language is the amber in which a thousand precious and subtle thoughts have been safely embedded and preserved. And actually, the quote goes on for several more sentences, and he talks about how it's our duty to preserve language and these brilliant bolts of lightning that are words and, and other things like that. So these guys are passionate about language and words. And in 1857, the three of them get together, and they're having a discussion at the Philological Society, and they kind of settle on this common problem, which is that the dictionaries of the day suck, right? They are really lacking in all sorts of different ways. And one of the important ways to them in which these dictionaries were lacking is that all kinds of really obscure words are missing. So word nerds, you know, they pride themselves on knowing all these obscure words, and they're not in the books, and that's a problem. So they create this group called the Unregistered Words Committee to track down these words and make lists of them and, and register them, so to speak, right? And that was the idea, was to produce that year a list of all these words that were not in dictionaries. Instead, uh, Trench, who um, was, I think, a pretty intense guy, he looks pretty intense, uh, ended up writing this kind of, this, this, this document, this treatise, called On Some Deficiencies in Our English Dictionaries. And he lists seven principal things that are wrong with dictionaries today, and, and he's pretty upset about some of these things. Number one is that many words are missing. Two is that the dates for the earliest use of words, that many of them are incorrect. He himself can say, no, no, I know that Chaucer used this and this time and such and such a thing. So, he, you know, they're able to find all these incorrect. And then there aren't enough quotations to illustrate what a word means now or what it used to mean back in the day. So he proposes this massive project to create a new dictionary of English that would be totally comprehensive, that would have all the English words, even the obsolete ones, uh, he does set a line, they draw a line and they say, any words that were obsoleted before 1150 AD, they won't put those in the dictionary. So, you know, pussies. But, the, <laughs> but they want to create this, this dictionary. They have a name for it. They're going to call it the New English Dictionary. And I'm not kidding. Everyone refers to it as NED, the New English Dictionary. That was the name of their project. So how, how do you do this? How do you go about this in the first place? Well, the primary thing they're trying to do is collect a list of words, find the earliest uses, and find quotations or citations for them. So they reason, I think, fairly rationally that they can divide the dictionary into sections, 26 or more sections. For each section, for each letter, they establish a sub-editor, someone who's in charge of that area. And then Trench's idea, and he writes it in this paper, and you can read it, um, is to ask volunteers to contribute citations for each word. So, you know, a volunteer can go out and, and say, hey, okay, here. And the way they do that, the theory is they can write them all on slips of paper. Trench doesn't develop that theory. That comes a little later. So Trench is just sort of, you know, in his paper, he's kind of laid out this massive vision of this new dictionary that was going to be totally comprehensive, and he even lays out kind of how to do it. But he was an archbishop. The church was not happy with all the amount of energy he was putting into, into language, and so he kind of disappears into the church, and he recedes. So that leaves the middle character, Coleridge, to take over, and he becomes the first official editor of NED, or the maintainer, you might say, of Project NED. And Coleridge uh, comes up with a pretty major innovation, which is that he has a special desk built in his house. Um, and do you guys know what pigeonholes are? So this, this is a form of, of RAM right, of random access memory. Because uh, you can approximately in the same time access the data that's in any of these. So the idea is he would have people mail him these slips of paper on which they had written the word, uh, you know, I don't know, abusion. And then they would write where they saw it. And, 
and they'd send it in, and he would sort these things into these pigeonholes. And he had 54 separate pigeonholes in his desk, and he collected all these pieces of paper. And he worked really fast. Um, in April of 1861, this is, I think, five months after he took over the editorship, he released version 0 0.1 of NED, which was like a couple dozen pieces of paper with words on them and citations. And, and his citations, by the way, had come primarily from academics, other people who would hang around the Philological Society, and they, and they also advertised. They put ads into learned journals of the time and asked people to, you know, could you please look for some words, and you know, that's sort of the nature of things, right? So they tried to, to solicit contributions this way. So what did, what did Coleridge do? Let's take a look at what this guy just did. First editor of the dictionary, he takes Trench's vision. It's not his vision. He figures out mechanically how to execute on this and, and creates this whole cubbyhole innovation. And then, within a very short period of time, he does his first release, right? And, and they facsimile, they, they copy the thing and they give it out to people. Then he gets tuberculosis and dies um, <laughs> a couple of weeks later. So. Trench is gone to the clergy, and Coleridge is dead. And, and you can see, I don't know if they, when they made this picture of him, but you can almost see the tuberculosis in his face, you know? So who does that leave? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. They called it consumption, I think. Is that what they called it, Tuber consumption at the time? Yeah. That was, by the way, that's the nicest picture I could find of tuberculosis. <laughs> Furnival. Furnival's left this weirdo, right? So Furnival takes over, and he has so much energy for this project. He is so excited, and he collects a lot of slips of paper, tons and tons. In fact, he collects two tons of paper. Um, he has sub-editors for every letter. They're all out there collecting data. But Furnival's personality had a flip side. And in addition to being enthusiastic, he was extremely distractible. During the course of this project, he, he decided he needed to establish a new English quotation society to collect quotations, and he does that. He founds two or three other societies and a college during this time. He starts to join a new church. He loses all of his money. Um, a lot of things happen. He also was a pain in the ass to work with. Some of you have worked with people in the software world like this, right? Where you submit a patch, and, and then, you know, for no reason they're rejecting it, or they don't respond, or then when they explain things to you, they're, they're just a, uh, not nice about it. So the sub-editors for letters A, I, J, N, O, and P all just resign. They're like, we can't work with this guy anymore. Eventually, it becomes obvious that uh, Furnival himself isn't going to be able to lead this project anymore, and he, he has the guts to resign, and he leaves a, just a disaster behind. Everything is disorganized. Slips of paper are everywhere. It turned out that one of the huge boxes of his papers, all for the letter H, all the words beginning in the letter H, show up in Italy at some point. Years later, uh, something like hundreds of pounds of the paper were burned for timber at one point. And the, the main thing I'll just point out is that for nine years, he reigned over this project, and he did no releases during this entire time. He starts these splinter projects. He's gathering paper and losing it, sending it to Italy for some reason. So I think we, we all know people like this, too. That would be me, by the way. I'm like that. So who steps in? This guy. Can you see? Well, unfortunately, you can't see him, which is maybe appropriate because he's sort of like a deity in the dictionary world, James Murray. Um, he was a, a, a man at Oxford, a member of the Philological Society, um, took up the task of editing this dictionary. And Murray was monomaniacal. He was totally obsessed with this project of creating the dictionary, way beyond anyone before him. He took this on as, as his life work. So instead of using learned journals, he puts ads in the newspaper, like the really crappy newspapers read by commoners. And he asks everybody to submit their quotations and, and, and citations. And he creates, and this is one of his great, he takes, he takes Coleridge's idea of building a desk with cubby holes, and he makes that look pathetic. In his property, he builds an entire building called the Scriptorium. And the Scriptorium can house, there are over 1,030 cubbyholes in the first version of the Scriptorium. And it grows and grows and grows. This is him at work in the Scriptorium. He also has, I think, seven children. All of them are put to full-time work helping him in the Scriptorium. <laughs> so Murray, 
At, and at one point at the peak, he was collecting 1,000 slips per day, and the British Postal Service actually installed an entire post station directly in front of his house just to receive all these things, right? And these are coming from all over the place. Remember, he, he really opened the gates and said anyone can contribute, right? Like the Jimmy Wales of the 1860s. So, so in fact, um, here he is collecting all these scripts. It's hard to find good pictures of him. But you, some of you have heard of this guy probably, W.C. Minor. It turned out after years and years, one of the contributors to Murray's dictionary project, which Oxford uh, University was by this time funding, uh, one of his most prolific contributors was a guy in Broadmoor Lunatic Asylum in England uh, who was there for having killed a couple of people, totally insane, chopped off his penis while he was put away in there, um, but really liked words and um, <laughs> so, you know, the bar is low and specific in this case and if you're, if you're willing to do this work and submit it, you can be a part of Murray's project. So, so these guys work together via the Postal Service and, and for most of that time nobody knew, you know, what was actually happening here. So, there's a great book, uh, The Professor and the Madman, which, which goes through all this stuff which you probably bought at an airport at one point. Uh, I did. So he's getting a thousand slips per day. In 1882, he's collected 3.5 million slips of paper and he and his, and his brood have sorted them. In 1884, they put out the second release, version 0 0.2 of NED. It's 352 pages long, and it covers the words A through ant. I don't know if anybody has been keeping track of the years here, but this is 23 years of work, 352 pages of the result, and 4,000 copies have been sold. And this man, James Murray, has devoted his life to it. So if you guys have some project you've been working on, and you start it and you're like, God, I gotta get a release out, or just remember this guy. <laughs> Don't feel so bad. You know where this is going, right? In 1928, the 1.0 version of this came out. This is the Oxford English Dictionary. This is the story of the Oxford English Dictionary. And um, a, couple, a lot of things happened between 0 0.2 and 1.0. They didn't use those numbers, by the way. But uh, it, for one thing, the, the project costs went out of control. At one point they had three separate main editors working on the project. Oxford, Oxford University tried to pull the plug on the project. There was a public outcry. Uh, the, the executive, I can't remember, whatever you call it, at the university, he was asked to step aside. And then a new guy came in and gave an unlimited budget to the finishing of the dictionary. And so they ended up with the Oxford English Dictionary. It had something like 500,000 words in its first edition in 1928. It didn't look like that. It cost 50 guineas. Um, by the time they'd done all that work, and by 28 to finish it, um, a lot of the early work was now obsolete because newer meanings had arisen in those old, you know, so they had to issue a supplement. And the supplement was basically an additional book which just had new information. So when you looked up a word, you had to first look it up in the supplement and then look it up in the main dictionary or vice versa to make sure you had the most current information. And then in 57, they had to issue another supplement. And there was a big debate at the time where they said, okay, should we simply issue a, a, a second supplement book so you have to look things up in three places? Should we reissue the whole supplement or should we try to fold it all into the dictionary? And they, they took the second route in 57, which was they issued a new supplement that was uh, comprehensive. And then finally, in 1983, they computerized this. They had 120 typists at a company they hired uh, in Florida. Uh, typing, it's 3.5 million characters of text. They had 55 proofreaders. They used Lex to type it all in. So it's all computerized, and the result is right now, all that work, uh, <laughs> over 150 years, you know, you can now get for $29.95 a month at OED.com, which I think is pretty expensive, if you want my opinion. So uh, why am I telling you this story? I mean, I, I think it's obvious. This, this was a an open source project in many, many different ways, and one of the early ones, right? It's people from all over the place, of all different backgrounds, contributing in a geographically distributed way to a centralized work. If you look at some of the lessons of today with copyright law and source of origin certification, things like that that we've had to do in the Linux kernel, it makes you wonder, in fact, about whether other people should be getting some portion of that $29.95 a month. But, um, but here we are. So what can we learn from the OED as a 
quote unquote open source project. Um, modern society is a vast pool of wasted human potential. Uh, I wrote untapped up there, but, but wasted is a better word. I mean, uh, you know, from, from lunatics in, in insane asylums to men whose free time allows them to spend their days building a new dictionary, there's so much potential out there. And if you can harness little tiny bits of it at a time, like a weekend day or a couple of hours in a morning, and then you can make that into something productive, then you can build something great, which the OED is. So finding ways to tap into that pool. The best projects tend to, be, tend to have as their leaders someone who's totally focused and utterly workaholic, someone who's just really incredibly into what they're doing. I think this is true with a lot of the best art, too. Um, like the TV show The West Wing. You guys ever watch that? No? Is that popular here? I have no idea. Some people. Yeah, I mean, Aaron Sorkin, you know, does crystal meth in a hotel room in Las Vegas and writes, you know, 90 hours a week, and, and that's why that's a good show. I mean, but he, he's not working on the show anymore. Um, the, the flip side of, and, and by the way, if you, if you attended some of the talks before, you know, there are some of these focused workaholics are here. Uh, the Luster talk, the, some, of, some, of the, some of the other talks that have come up. Of course, the flip side is I think some of the worst projects tend to be led by focused workaholics too. So it is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, the other thing, and, and this is probably the obvious lesson, is that when you create, if you want to create a successful open source project, it's very important that you create what Tim O'Reilly calls an architecture of participation. So you design into your system, into the way your software, your whatever it is you're building is built, an architecture which allows people to participate and contribute in small pieces. That's a lot of what Mike was saying. So those are the, some of the things from the OED. Now, my day job is the Linux desktop, and uh, so I guess I'll talk to you a little bit about that, um, give you a kind of a little bit of an overview. Those of you who've been around Linux for a while or Unix, you know, might recognize this kind of screenshot. This is a approximately a, you know, circa 1992 Linux desktop. We have a plan, which was a motif application. We have down here a calculator, and uh, you could spend a lot of time configuring that with X resources. There's X term and, and O'clock, which was shaped up in the corner. Very good stuff. Things progressed quickly when the Linux desktop projects, GNOME and KDE, started in uh, 1997 and 1996, respectively. Uh, this is a screenshot of GNOME from about uh, 1998, I believe, October 22nd, according to that. So what is that, eight years and five days ago? Um, and uh, things have gotten, well, let's say there's more quantity of stuff on the screen. But I don't know that things have gotten appreciably better for the users. Um, basically, what you had were a bunch of Unix geeks, C hackers, Lisp and Scheme hackers trying to create a desktop environment. So people who don't really need or really aren't even interested in using a desktop trying to create one um, because they, they, wanted, you know, they wanted a lot of users, right? So you'll, you'll remember that if you go back to the OED, the first copy of the OED to be sold sold 4,000 copies. I guarantee you it had more than 4,000 contributors. So um, that was probably the situation we were in in some ways with, with the early Linux desktop. Uh, so things were very complicated. Um, if you look carefully, you see in the upper left-hand corner, you may but wonder, Nat, what, what is that grid of strange glyphs, right? You may be asking yourself that, but you'd be saying Nat when you ask yourself that, so maybe you have some identity problems. But this grid is, this is a hex editor, hexadecimal editor. So one of our first efforts was to create a GUI hexadecimal editor. Um, <laughs> G-hex, we called it. So, so I don't know, the energy was there, the enthusiasm was there, but the aim was off, if you know what I mean. <laughs> And it, you know, there's just plenty of examples of this. This is using the Swiss cheese theme, um, which allows your desktop to look like it's made out of Swiss cheese, um, which is, you know, very nice. But was that a priority at the time? You know, probably not. So and you, again, you can also see this, this, this screenshots are emblematic, not only the state of the of Linux desktop back then, but of the state of Linux desktop screenshots, where the goal was to brag to all your friends about how many applications you had managed to compile and make run on your computer. So it's like, I got all these damn things working, so I'm going to take a screenshot of all of them and put it on the screen. So that's kind of how it was. 
Now, there were really good motivations here. I mean, Linux and the server had started to succeed in a big way. We'd, you know, we'd seen, uh, or we'd started to see uh, companies grow up around Linux servers. Uh, 1998, 99, Oracle and others started to uh, get involved. IBM pledged support for Linux. There was obviously something happening here. We saw a server operating system that was taking off. And in any organization, you know, for every server, you tend to have like 20 desktops, or I don't know what the ratio is, but you have more desktops than servers by a lot. And so the concept was if we could make Linux desktop usable and, and make it reach regular people, then we could reach so many people with free software. You know, with the freedom to use software, we create this, this base of innovation that other people could contribute to. That was an exciting idea. So, so that was the uh, will behind it. But we didn't know about uh, usability. That was one thing we needed to spend more time learning about. Um, so I'm just going to do a little aside for you now. That's an eyeball in the upper left-hand corner. And uh, this is taken from some research uh, that I found about, um, about how people see. Um, and actually, I don't know if you guys read Oliver Sacks' books, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, Awakenings, An Anthropologist on Mars, A Leg to Stand On, The Island of the Colorblind, all fabulous books. Um, but one of the things he talks about in some of his books is that the brain is not just this homogenous mush, right? It's not, um, you know, if you look at two parts of the brain on a small enough scale, they'll, they'll look different because there are different thought organs inside the brain that behave differently. So how we see, well, there are a couple of thought organs that are involved in that, or, or a couple of stages. The first stage of seeing is what we call the pre-attentive stage. This is the stuff that happens automatically when I look out. You know, my, my eye and the neurons that directly connect to my optic nerve do some processing without my higher consciousness really getting involved. Not to imply that I have a higher consciousness than you guys, but I do, no. Um, <laughs> with, you know, without, without the whole um, conscious awareness being involved. So this is your visual cortex. Um, it's made up of large arrays of neurons that act in parallel to automatically process um, what you're seeing. And it can pick out things like color, uh, texture, edges, outlines, shapes. Um, it, it's fast. Uh, the eye moves. An eye movement takes about 200 milliseconds. And between 200 and 250 milliseconds, the pre-attentive cognition can happen. Uh, so you can recognize things very quickly. After that, stage two is attentive visual cognition. And this tends to proceed sequentially, right? So if you're looking at a series of objects, you'll move from one to the next recognizing them. You can't look at a bunch of objects and recognize them all at once. So um, to illustrate this, I'm going to give you guys a little quiz. So are you guys ready for this quiz? <laughs> OK. Well, we're going to have to get ready for the quiz. So um, let me ask again, and you guys give me just an answer out loud. Are you ready to take this quiz? Yes. OK. Louder. Are you ready for some pre-attentive visual cognition? <laughs> okay, the way this quiz works is I'm going to show you something on the screen here, and I'm going to ask you a question, and you have to answer as quickly as possible, all at once, out loud. Right? That's very important. So it's easy. I promise you, you're not going to look stupid. It's very easy. Everyone will get everything right, probably. Um, so if I were to show you 2 plus 2, you would yell, Okay, but you have, to, you have to do better than that, seriously, right? Okay, so the seven times three, that's good. Okay, but louder. Okay, I'm sorry, it's just really going to be much more effective if you're loud and fast. Most things are effective if you're loud and fast. All right. <laughs> Five times seven. Okay, I think you're ready. You go into the quiz with the audience you have, not the audience you want. That's <laughs> so here we go. Ready? How many circles? Four. Very good. All right. How many red? Five. Good. How many circles? <laughs> OK. What happened there, guys? 
Those first two exercises you could do with your pre-attentive systems. You could, you could easily see very quickly how many circles there are because you, you don't even have to think. That's your visual cortex doing that for you. How many red, you can do two. But when I mix them up like that, you know, basically you totally fail. So <laughs> you have to go one by one and count them or you know, two by two or something like that. So the lesson here is that when you're building, um, well, there's no lesson really. I just think it's fun. But, <laughs> but one possible tangential lesson you could associate with this exercise we just did is that when you're building uh, interfaces and software for people to use, it's not only important to understand how the software works and what you're trying to accomplish with the software, but it's also important to understand how people work because you're going to have to interface with them. So. We started to think about that in the Linux desktop world, and a lot of us read this guy named Joel Spolsky, joelonsoftware.com uh, or .org, something like that. And, uh, and he, this is a, I don't know if, I guess this is blocking the picture. This is a picture of him, um, and maybe you can't see very well, but he looks very youthful and uh, full of vim, and he's carrying a backpack, and he's thin, he's very thin, and uh, he's smiling. And I, I met him, um, he came to our office several years ago. He looks nothing like this. This is on his website, on like every one of his articles. And he's like this pretty big guy, and he looks kind of old and boring. And this guy looks spunky, like the underdog. This guy did not look like the underdog. But anyway, um, first rule of software, and he's got a great book on software usability that you can download for free and read or buy off of Amazon. But he says, the user interface is well designed when the program behaves exactly how the user thought it would. So I think that's, that's pretty good. I can't remember what's in the rest of my talk, so I'm just going to see what's on the next slide. Oh, so uh, somewhere during this whole process, I started a company, and I wanted to just tell you about that if that's OK with you, even if it's not OK with you. Um, I met this guy that you can't see very well, Miguel de Casa. This is, uh, he's from Mexico, and um, he didn't speak English very well when I met him, but he was on IRC and Usenet, and that's most of how he learned English. Um, and uh, this was from when I flew to Mexico City to hang out with him, and I got much better pictures than this, but uh, I couldn't find them right now. So anyway, um, yeah, so Miguel and I met, and uh, we decided to start a company together to join forces uh, and engage in capitalist exercises uh, around open source. So. Um, so we, we, you know, we sort of spent like, I, this was, uh, I guess, 1999, the summer of 99. I was graduating from college, and I'd done some hacking on some projects with Miguel before and contributed some to the Linux desktop, and, and Miguel was leading the GNOME project at the time. And, um, and I really wanted to start a company. And so we spent the summer kind of traveling around to conferences, trying to figure out what that would mean to start a company. And at the time, everybody was starting companies. It was 1999, you know, like, we were all going to be millionaires, and eating food in pill form and flying around in jet packs very soon. So we're very excited about that. Well, the pill form food anyway. Um, but uh, we went around to conferences. And actually, the way I did that, in case you're curious, because I didn't have any money to apply to these conferences, is that I would find a big company near the site of the conference, and I would apply for a job there. And I would ask to go for an interview. And then they would fly me out for the interview. And I'd say, look, can I have the rental car for a couple more days? And then I would go to the conference on their time. Um, and uh, so that, was, that worked great, except when I went to IBM to interview in Raleigh. And I ended up in a full like, day of interviews. And the last four hours were this uh, test of my cognitive abilities, where you fill in little bubbles. <laughs> and I was like, this is not worth it. This is not. <laughs> but um, I met the guy who did Control-Alt-Delete, who, who chose that, those keystrokes, and that was cool. He worked in a windowless office in Raleigh, North Carolina. So um, <laughs> something told me not to work for IBM. But you invent Control-Alt-Delete, you get your window taken away. I think none of them had windows, actually. But, uh, so it didn't, didn't make sense. But we, we went around, and we eventually we found some venture capitalists. And uh, eventually, there was a couple venture capitalists who were sort of new to the game of venture capital. You might say they were amateurs or novices or not uh, fully capable um, or something like that. And, uh, but very nice guys, um, very willing to inv get involved in Linux. And we decided we would raise um, some money from them. We decided we would raise uh, $1.6 million. And 
So we sat down and we negotiated in a restaurant in Boston with them how much of the company that you know, they should get for the 1.6 million. And I think at the time what we decided was that Miguel and I, even though we had no code, no proprietary assets, no business or real work experience, that we were each worth, just by being there, a million dollars each. So that sounded pretty good. And then they were going to put in one point something million. So you know, um, they would get about half the company, and we would get about half the company. And that was kind of how we raised the first money. And then there ended, ended like this long process of negotiating the deal terms with them. Um, where I got to hang out with lawyers a lot. And I remember very distinctly going into the office of my lawyer in downtown Boston on the 35th floor overlooking the water and the airport and everything like that. And she wasn't in her corner office at the time, so I was just kind of waiting around. And then her secretary came in and said, oh, you must be here to move the desk. Why don't you just uh, grab that end? But uh, I did help move the desk. Um, then she came in, everybody was embarrassed. But, uh, yeah, so, so we're in this process, and then it's kind of coming down to the wire, and these guys are, are giving us a lot of trouble delivering the money. And then I get this phone call from one of the VCs, one of the investors, and he says, Nat, we've transferred the money. I said, what? We, we didn't sign any documents. He says, yeah, I was just sick of this whole process, so I just transferred the money. And I was like, okay, I got to go. I'll be right back. <laughs> So I called my lawyer and I said, I think they transferred the money. And I'm at the airport, I'm about to fly to San Francisco for a conference. So I go to the ATM, and of course at the time I had the ATM card for our corporate bank account. So I just went into the ATM, there's a line, but I got to the front and I did a screen display of the balance. And I was, you know, shocked to see that $1.6 million was in there. Actually, not only was $1.6 million in there, for some reason there was an extra $500,000 and there was $2.1 million in the account and it like ran off the screen. <laughs> so first step was I printed as many ATM receipts as I could. <laughs> then I realized that all this money was sitting in checking and it should probably be moved into the savings account. <laughs> so um, I said transfer two one zero 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 zero. And then it gave me an error. So I, in the end I had to transfer it in $500,000 chunks into the <laughs> savings account. And, uh, what we ended up doing was simply tell, and then they, they called us, we think we transferred too much money, we're not sure what happened. Uh, we said we, we, um, we, we actually ended up keeping all the money. So, <laughs> so we started this company called Zimian. We hired a bunch of our friends from the internet, um, <laughs> basically, <laughs> um, who, who joined us to build, uh, to build this company. We released th some versions of the Linux desktop. Eventually, we discovered that we needed to have large corporate customers, and we found out how to do that. Um, this slide sucks, but you get the idea. Um, and then we met Novell in 2003. And uh, Novell, we didn't know much about Novell, but Novell started talking to us about acquiring us, and the, we got very excited, actually about this because here's Novell, this old line company, no involvement in Linux, you know, visibly for quite some time except spinning off Caldera years and years ago. And um, the, the idea, if we could take Novell, 6,000 people, global footprint, and wrap a Linux strategy around that and use the sort of large company's resources to, to accelerate Linux and you know, start to generate Linux sales, that could be really exciting. And besides, we knew as a company of 75, 80 people, we weren't going to make the Linux desktop happen by ourselves. We needed help. And so help came in the form of Novell. So they were going to buy our company. And we, we wanted to make some communication uh, to the world that put on our website to explain that we had sold our company to Novell. And this was what <laughs> we originally came up with. And <laughs> we, we didn't put that up in the end. I wanted to, but cooler heads prevailed. And at Novell, uh, for the last couple of years, the product that I've spent most of my time working on is SUSE Linux Enterprise Desktop 10, which is the desktop product that we just released. Um, it's a Linux desktop. It's the first Linux desktop that I consider really, truly, generally usable by basic office workers, people who live in mail, calendar, uh, web browser, office suite. If those are your needs. Um, you know, and you have some interoperability needs like Active Directory Exchange Server and some others, then, then we can really fulfill these. And I think that's the first time I've really been able to say that with, with confidence. Um, instead of that long name, we often just, just shrink it to SLED 10, which works pretty good, except in Holland. Um, does anybody know? I guess in Dutch, SLED means 
means prostitute, so. <laughs> there were some jokes about bulk volume deals, and, but. Um, I think every word means prostitute in Dutch, if you want my opinion, but. Anyway, SLED 10 has gotten fantastic reviews. InfoWorld said this summer, SLED 10 is hands down the most polished desktop Linux distribution I've ever used, and that includes Ubuntu. This is the pre-release before the final release was out. Gartner, in an analyst report last month, said if you can use Windows, then you can use SLED. Dan Lyons of Forbes Magazine, a mainstream reporter, said Novell has just produced a Linux desktop so sleek that I didn't want to return the demo machine they loaned me, and I just bought a copy for my office PC. And CRN, in their most heavily trafficked article of all time, said, SUSE Linux Enterprise Desktop 10 has the feature set, compatibility, and flexibility to meet the needs of most corporate desktop users. What's more, at a price point roughly one-tenth of what Vista and Office 2007 will cost, SUSE Linux becomes harder to ignore. So we've gotten a lot of great accolades whoops, for this desktop. Um, and we're starting to get some great sales for it, too. Um, so how much time do I have? Does somebody want to give me a time check? Five minutes? Five minutes or so? Keep going. Got it. So I want to show you, I'm going to take very, very little time because I have very, very little time, but I want to show you a couple of things from this Linux desktop. Have you guys seen SLED? A couple of people have. Okay. Um, and I'm going to show you three things in particular, uh, which are projects created by three individuals. So the, the primary person doing all the work on the project is an individual, one guy. First one's Aaron Bachover. Um, He's, I don't know how old he is. I think he's 17. Um, he produced a music application for us called Banshee. Larry Ewing, um, Larry just had a kid. Larry's most well known uh, today for having been the guy who drew the Linux penguin, Tux. You, you've seen the little penguin? It's like the Buddha penguin. Um, and David Reeveman, uh, who's a very eccentric employee we hired about a year ago, um, who works in Sweden. And I'll tell you more about him in a second. So those are the, I want to show you their projects. This is our desktop. I've been, I've been doing this presentation, in fact, entirely in our desktop, as you might guess. And uh, I got a couple of windows on the screen here. And you can see I can just hit Alt-Tab to move between them. And you'll notice that I get a little preview of the app before I switch to it in the Alt-Tab window there, which is kind of cool. So see that? What do you think? Is that cool? Yeah, all right. So somebody thought it was cool. Some guy gave me two thumbs up. And you can also do this, you just move the mouse to the upper left-hand corner and your windows split out like that, or you can hit the, I think we have the pause key configured so that you can do that too, right? So that's kind of cool. Um, so what I'm showing you here and showing, uh, well, so, so, so all of that's kind of part of a new graphics infrastructure we have in the desktop. Um, there's a system called the Compositing Manager. Um, and we have one called Compiz, which this guy wrote, David Reifman. Uh, which is doing all these effects. So I'll show you some more of those effects in a minute. But I kind of want to show you the other things in the desktop, too. So, but in order to do that, I need a volunteer. Um, so what, can I have a volunteer, please? Somebody, yeah, come on up here on the stage, please. And then I need one other volunteer. Yep, all right. If you could just make your way up to the stage, please. And a third volunteer. Uh, you, the philological guy, who knew what a philological society was. All right, so you can put your bag down. All right, and if you guys just could stand up there. All right, so we're going to do some pictures. Hold on, I have to figure out. Was that? No, it's okay. I got a flash on this. It'll totally nuke whatever you guys have going with that projector. How do you turn? Okay, auto. I guess that's how it's going to go. All right, now you guys, you know, you're very good looking people, but you don't look good right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in some emotion into this picture. So we're going to try different emotions. So the first one, I think it'll come naturally, is fear. So just try to look <laughs> as shocked as possible, just like scared, whatever works. Just look scared. OK. OK. I'll give you a count. I got to give you a count. So ready? One, two, three, fear. That was good. That was really good. All right. Now we're going to do. Um, uh, horror. No, that's too similar to fear. No, we'll do happiness. So just look like you just won a million dollars, something like that. <laughs> okay, pretty good. It's pretty good. Okay, now I want you guys to all put your hands in the middle like you're going to break, like, you know, like you're a part of a team, like the philological society. All right. Which one is Furnival? That's what I want to know. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, a hand, big hand for everybody here. So now, this is my Canon. I, I, uh, somebody gave this to me as a gift. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug it in. I will simply plug it into the computer. Um, here we go. And you notice that a window appeared on the screen when I did that. I didn't, I didn't touch the computer. I just plugged it in. And the window says, let me get rid of these other windows that are distracting you guys so much. It says a camera has been detected. There are photos on this camera. So if you've used the Linux desktop in the past, you see this window, suddenly the whole world feels different. Because in the past, even if you have the drivers and everything's configured properly, and so forth, you, know, you plug a device into your computer and nothing happens. And so the next step is you open the terminal, you type dmessage to find out which device was created and which, and then you have to mount it yourself. And then you want to copy the photo. But this one just says there are photos on this camera. Would you like to add these pictures to I'm just going to zoom in so you can see. And so then I just simply say import photos. And it opens my photo management app. And I say copy. And it copies those four photos from the camera. And then here they are. And uh, we can view them in full screen mode. So that's the Ferneval, Coleridge, and Trench. This is actually works out, I think, by the way. This looks like Trench. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry about the... <laughs> But you're going to die of consumption in about a month. And here we have Ferneval, who will found many societies. So, so you have you know, these pictures just show up. So it's so very easy. You, know, you can just plug a device in. We have excellent hot plug support now. And what I'm showing you here is this application called FSpot. And FSpot was written by um, where is he? Larry Ewing. You may recall from that slide. And FSpot's kind of a great application. He wrote it as a single individual. There's, there's a lot of contributors, though. But it's really nice because it scales really well. You can have a lot of different pictures in F-Spot. Uh, you can switch between them really quickly. I think it's about an eighth of a second um, when you hit, between when you hit the key and when you see the next um, image start to display. We do that by progressively loading the images. An eighth of a second, you may remember, is, uh, very, is just, just under the precognition speed. So, so that's pretty good. So there's Ted. This is one of the guys I work with. Oh, you can't see anything. Oh, this is horrible. I had no idea. Well, they're beautiful images, let me tell you. And, uh, and I have at home, I have FSpot loaded up. I have about 45,000 different pictures. It also, in addition to scaling to lots of pictures, gives you a few different organizing principles. So you can see there's this timeline at the top, and you can jump to whatever part of your history you want to. So there's a, it's like a little histogram. You can see in May of 2005, we took 87 photos. In June, we took 32. I don't have all my pictures in here. These, in fact, are other people's pictures, but I would never show my own. But um, that's kind of nice because you can jump between pictures. And then the other thing you can do is you can actually tag photos. So here are my favorite photos. They're tagged with the, the heart. And you can see there they are, all heart tagged, right? Like this, this beautiful photo of the elephant. Um, and what I could do if I wanted to is I could take, for example, this photo and tag it with the heart, and then it will show up in my favorites. I just dragged the heart on there. And then, of course, I can, I can edit these things. I can just crop that. Uh, or you can really you know, get specific. Um, and then you can, you, know, you can really adjust like, the exposure level and make it really artistic, um, like so, very artistic. And then you'll notice that the, this picture here, this, the thumbnail changes. But if you want, you can always go back to the original and because it saves, uh, saves all your changed versions. And so you can, you can actually jump around them. And uh, it's very easy. I don't actually think I'm online, but you can just file, export these to a CD or to Flickr. And let me see. I haven't, I haven't authorized this one against my Flickr account, but, but, it, but that's all really easy to do. And it has a bunch of other neat features. You can create your own tags, for example. So I can say these are all Seneca. I just type the word Seneca. And you'll notice that a new tag here, Seneca, appeared. Uh, so it's very easy to organize your pictures if you have a lot of them. So that's FSpot from Larry. Um, very cool application. The next one I'm going to show you is Banshee. So I have, um, this is my iPod. This is my black iPod Nano. And I'll plug it in to the computer. And do not disconnect appears on the iPod. And then this application starts. Now, if you have used a Linux desktop in the past, um, you know that you get um, 
you get your desktop, and, and basically you can play AUG Forbis and AUG Theora files, and that's it. And then you go out to the internet to a website in Russia or, or Hungary or something like that, and you download some illegal uh, RPMs that allow you to... So what we did uh, to play MP3s and stuff like that, what we did instead uh, with SLED 10 is we established a partnership with Real Networks, and um, using their Helix framework, we built an open source music player called Banshee, and this is it. And Banshee uh, can out of the box play MP3s, AAC files, real audio files, MPEG-4 audio, uh, and it can even encode MP3s, which means if you take a CD and you put it in, then we can actually rip the CD, encode uh, all those tracks into MP3, and then you're able to synchronize them to your device. So there's kind of two interesting things about Banshee. Number one is it's legal, and it does all this media stuff out of the box. It's free with SLED. And two, it actually puts all your music functionality in one place. So I have my music library, and I can play <laughs> music from it. Like the Novel On the rebound from our trip to Nuremberg, this is Novell Open Audio. I can play Novell podcasts, right? It will play other podcasts too, but... Um, <laughs> and then you'll even notice that this is my iPod that I plugged in, and if you look carefully, you can see these are all my iPod songs, and I can even, uh, my, you know, my music tastes are pretty, pretty dorky, but um, like there's a lot of Coldplay on here, but um, you can play music right off of your iPod, even if it's not in your music libraries, so that's handy. You can't do that with iTunes today. And then, if you look really carefully, you'll notice that, well, actually, wait, before I do that, uh, the other thing I can do is I can drag songs onto my iPod, like this Novell Open Audio thing, and then you simply hit the synchronize iPod button, save manual changes, and it synchronizes them all onto your iPod, and there it's done. So, very easy. Um, and then you'll also, if you look carefully, you see the name of my iPod is here, and if you look really, really closely, you'll see that that icon is a black nano. See that? Hello? Okay, good. That's because this is a black nano. So if this were a pink something, or um, a video iPod, the icon actually changes to match type of iPod that you've just plugged in. So, so there's a lot of nice touches in there. And all of this was done by this guy, Aaron Bachover, who loves iPods. So, uh, so that's Banshee. And then the last thing I want to show you is you'll notice, you might have noticed that as I've been using the computer um, and, and making windows appear and disappear, you're starting to see some kind of cool animations. I'm slowing it down so you can see the effect. See? So when I bring that window back, kind of zooms up out of the taskbar like that. And then you also notice this, and of course uh, this, uh, whoops, this effect here, where you can have all of your windows sort of tile. Um, there's a couple other things too. You may notice when we move a window, it becomes semi-translucent so you can see through it. This is really helpful if you're typing an email and the information you're trying to refer to is underneath your window. You can just pick it up for a second. Oh, there's the phone number and, and type it. Uh, I find that pretty useful. All this stuff is really easily configurable in our control center, so I'll just show you how you do that. Um, because you can turn on some extra effects, like you can make windows wobble when they're moved, too. Um, actually, it was an engineer at Red Hat who wrote the, the wobbling functionality. So this was transparent and it's wobbling. And then you can also make windows stick together. I don't know how you do that exactly. When you hold shift, it's supposed to do that. Um, Zooming, you've noticed before, too. That's good for demos. If you're a web developer and you want to look at pixels and you know, that kind of thing, you can do that uh, with the zooming pretty easily. And um, there's some other features. Um, actually, one thing I'll just show you right now is there's a search feature in the desktop. So I search for Prisoner, and here's this movie. This is actually the trailer for the Harry Potter movie, Prisoner of Azkaban. Um, and you can see that I can move this window around while the trailer plays, and that all works. So we give you all these different ways of organizing your windows and, and things like that, but, but if you still end up running out of space, one thing you can do is just take a window and drag it to the next desktop over here. Um, so we've organized the desktops into a cube, and you can ask the desktop, the windows to follow you around, you can, and I'm hitting some key combinations now to make it do this. And um, it's not just doing it by itself. <laughs> this is me. So you can flip around. And this is, this is cool for me. What I do is I, usually I put the work I'm doing on one face of the cube, then all my distractible items go on the others. Like IM is on one side, email is on another, 
the web browsers I try to keep on another side of the cube. And then you can just flip it around and do your work. And it's kind of cool because if you're waiting for something to happen, like a web page to load or a compile to finish, you do your work here, and you just sort of peek around. It's not done yet. Uh, you know, you kind of keep doing your work. Um, and then, oh, the top and bottom, I'll show you in a sec. You can also, if you have a movie that's playing, you can even put it on the corner. Welcome, you don't welcome see anything here, to right? another year at Hogwarts. Um, I'm going to, just because of the poor uh, lighting situation, I'm going to show you a different movie, um, which will hopefully look a little better. Here it is. Welcome to the Central Park Zoo. Just smile and wave, boys. Today we're going to blow this dump. So the other thing you can do that's kind of cool is if you've got a bunch of windows, you can, you can do this and unfold the cube and then scroll through it unfolded like that. And, uh, oh, I'll just mention one other thing. Where is it? Um, I had that configuration thing here somewhere. You can actually modify the number of sides on the cube. So right now we have four, and you can see it says Novell at the top and on the bottom, right? So if you want to have, uh, you can add six, and then you can see we have more sides in the cube. And um, so what is this? Then we have, this is Novell, after years of innovation, has created the eight-sided cube. So <laughs> it took a lot of investment, but we did it. Um, so, you know, so, so all this stuff is very flashy and, and fun. Uh, you can put raindrops on your screen. There's some way to do... Um, make it rain, and I think there's a window, windshield wiper you can enable. Um, there are people who have done plugins. It's all a fully pluggable system. Plugins that make menus, you know, spin when they come out, and and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, some people question the utility of all of this, um, <laughs> <laughs> with some good reason. But um, you know, those people tend to lead dark and lonely lives. I think you know, <laughs> because. You know, when I'm in the airport and I use, you know, it's just, you, you kind of just want to use this after looking at it for a while. You want to play with it. It's really easy to play with. And that makes it much easier to learn to use it. If something actually has some appeal to it, you're more likely to spend the time to learn to use it. And we've got, we have found some uses for this kind of stuff in uh, call centers, for example, where people do email and online support, where they'll put a customer on each side and all their windows arranged for that customer and flip back to them. And, or server administration. We've seen server administrators do that kind of thing. There's a lot of other features. I was about to show you visual basic macro compatibility. We have out of the box active directory integration. Uh, we have a lot of other functionality that's kind of really focused on enterprises. Um, what sort of media pretty much anything from the last two years will work well. ATI and video or Intel. Um, we, we make all that really easy. It's one click to configure this. If you don't have the ATI or an NVIDIA driver, it's automatically downloaded from their sites and installed on your computer and configured for you. So it's, well, it's actually two clicks or three clicks, but it's the same button. You just have to click it three times. So it's very obvious when you use it, though. Don't worry. So um, we recently have a, cu we have a customer in Europe right now who's looking to deploy this um, to 65,000 desktops. That they're, it's a large manufacturer in Europe. And we've been working very hard with them for the last three or four months to solve all their interoperability problems, Active Directory, everything else. And we've really been successful, and it's been very exciting because we think it's going to be one of the first public cases of a really usable Linux desktop getting out there and someone displacing Windows and then saying it worked. And then last week, or maybe, I don't remember when it was, within the last couple of weeks, Steve Ballmer flew to Europe to visit this customer to tell them to stop their Linux desktop project. And we had invested so much time in this project. You have no idea. So much work, on-site engineer visits. You know, we were just eating it to make this customer work because they were so aggressive. And so we were really worried about what would happen. And Balmer sat down with the CIO of the company and said, you got to stop this Linux desktop thing. you got to work with us. We're going to make it cheap for you. We'll lower the price. We'll cut it out. And the customer went back to uh, Balmer and said, it's too late. We are too far down the Linux desktop path. If you want to compete with the Linux desktop, you've got to do it technically now. You can't compete by lowering the price. So that was very exciting uh, for us. That was, a, that was a big moment. So stay tuned. There will be big news. You can download SLED off of Novell's website, novell.com slash Linux. Go grab it yourself. If you want to email me, uh, it's pretty unlikely I'll reply. No. <laughs> but 
My email address is here. It's nat at novell.com. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. This was a great event. I really enjoyed the talks and, and meeting some of you. Uh, a lot of my friends are here, too. That, that's very cool. So thank you guys for having me. I appreciate the time. Thanks. That's great. Thanks very much, Nat. I'm going to present you with this. Oh, thank you. And um, so that's it, except for in the back of your name badge, you have some beer tickets. And so symposium meaning drinking party. You could go out there and you can begin drinking. You can join Nat, have a beer out there. Anyway, thanks very much, Nat. Thank you.